the week after Pearl Harbor, the Army Air Forces set out to perfect and have produced in quantity just as quickly as possible a powerful airplane engine for a huge, fast, long-range bomb. At that time, only in the blueprint stage. The Wright 18-cylinder, 2,200-horsepower engine was decided upon. An impressless operation was given the job of designing a plant, specifying the equipment needed, and then staffing and operating the plant to build 1,600 of the engines a month. The plant and equipment, which was to be one of the largest in the world, was to be owned by the government. But the company was assigned full responsibility for all details of construction and operation. The engine consisted of two banks of nine cylinders each, compactly joined to operate a single transfer, transmitting power through reduction gears to the propeller shaft. It contained more than 13,000 pieces. The plant was laid out to manufacture in part or completely practically all of the major functional parts of the engine. The materials required to build and equip the plant and the rest of the parts and supplies required to produce the engine were purchased from some 5,000 subcontractors. A 500-acre tract on the southwest side of Chicago was selected as the site of this vast new manufacturing operation. And construction of the Dodge Chicago plant, as it was called, began in June of 1942. The first building erected was the tool shop. Over a million and a half jigs, tools, and fixtures were needed, and many of them were made in this building as the first step towards engine production. By October, the office buildings were partially completed, and the organization, which already had been partially assembled in Detroit, was moved to the Chicago plant. Because of a national shortage of forging capacity, a dye shop and forge division was set up. This was housed in three buildings. And because of the large number of aluminum cylinder heads needed, an aluminum foundry was built. One of the nation's most modern magnesium foundries was included to produce the magnesium castings required. A 10-acre basement under the main machining and assembly building housed some of the cafeteria and the tunnels connecting working areas inside the building with the parking lot and bus loading station. This parking lot was a block wide and a mile long, large enough to hold the amazing number of 13,000 automobiles. The machining and assembly building covered 82 acres, 22 of which were completely air conditioned. It contained railway siding and receiving and shipping docks, storage areas, machining areas, assembly lines. In all, 19 buildings were erected some as much as two miles apart. Power houses, water reservoirs, plant protection, and other miscellaneous buildings made the plant a city in itself. During construction, approximately 150 freight car loads and 80 truck loads of materials were used daily. At one time, 16,000 carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and other workmen were engaged in the building operation. The last roof section of the main building was completed in February of 1943. But long before the buildings were completed, machinery and equipment began to be moved into place, and people trained to operate them. Manufacturing operations on most of the engine parts began in the forge, where billets of metal were given rough size and shape by batteries of hammers and of feathers. This scene was taken just before VJ Day in the heavy forge building, where many of the large engine parts were made. Here, cylinder barrels were made by machines called upsetters, from stock fed into them after being heated in furnaces located on either side of the upset. The hot bar of steel was shaped into hollow barrels and literally bitten into the exact length needed. These barrels then dropped on conveyors and were taken to cooling pits. It was not possible to feed the entire bars of stock into the upsetter to make cylinder barrels. The small length left over was not wasted. They were processed here in a special upsetter which made another barrel and reclaimed of all but a few pounds of the steel, salvaging tons of metal a month. Hundreds of thousands of engine parts had been shaped here in the heavy forge by the upsetters and giant hammers when suddenly all activity 
Kennedy. At 6 o'clock, Chicago time in the afternoon of August the 14th, came the official announcement that Japan had surrendered. Within 30 minutes, all production had stopped, and all the buildings of the engine plant were emptied of employees. With the exception of a few assembly and shipping operations, production was never resumed. Soon the furnaces and the heavy forge were closed, and the upsetters and hammers fired. The building was deserted, with the exception of a few maintenance and cleanup men. The middle aisle of the light forge built, where millions of smaller engine parts were hammered out, was as empty as a deserted street in a ghost town. Silence reigned in the rough machining area of the next building. Bins of parts along the heat treat oven sat motion. The tool section of this building, one of the first to be erected, was also deserted. In addition to forged parts made from raw stock, other important engine parts had been made by casting both aluminum and magnesium in two of the most modern foundries in the United States. In these two, all engineer production stopped. The mold ovens were abandoned, and the conveyor lines empty. The pumps in which aluminum bullets were melted for pouring into molds were sold. There was no activity in the area where the cylinder heads were broken from the mold and made ready for machines. All that remained to indicate how busy this aluminum foundry had been at the peak of production were stacks of finished heads awaiting transfer to the machining building. It was the same story over in the magnesium foundry. Here in this area, molds for seven parts of the engine were built. Molds for these parts were made in much the same manner as for the aluminum cast. Moving along conveyor road, now motion. Since the magnesium castings were large and complicated, molds for them were handled like the stuff assemblies of automobiles, moving along roller beds into a main assembly line. Hundreds of thousands of magnesium castings ready to be moved over to the machining building were at one end of the foundry when production ceased. Whether from the plant's own forges and foundries, from other Chrysler plants in Detroit, Newcastle, or Dayton, or the thousands of subcontractors, everything needed to make the engine came to the receiving dock of this building. They passed through inspection and into storage area from where they moved across the plant, being processed and assembled into an engine. In between storage and assembly were some 50-odd acres of machine, more than 9,000 in all. Each machine had a specific job to do on some part of the engine. During production, this was a beehive of activity. For instance, cylinder valves sent by the upsetters in the heavy forge were worked on by 18 different kinds of lathes, grinders, and other machines before they were ready to be joined to the cylinder head. From the aluminum foundry, the cylinder heads were machined in a series of progressive operations in this amazing, almost human machine. There were two of these machines in the plant. Each was over 200 feet long. Each turned out 67 cylinder heads an hour and performed 269 operations on each head. Every B-29 engine had 18 cylinder heads and bands besides the many made for replacement. This department turned out as many as 60,000 a month. One of the largest sections of the plant was given over to the machining of the crankcase section, shaped by the giant hammers in the heavy forge. The crankcase was made in three sections, the first machined here as separate units. Finishing operations were performed after the three sections had been fitted together. The crankshaft was also made up of three sections, front, center, and rear, in addition to counterweight. Master rod forgings went through many machine operations from the time they started down the line until they were given the final inspection, after which they were ready for assembly. Articulating rods were machined in much the same manner as the master rod. The propeller shaft was machined in this general area from another rough forging shaped in the heavy forge. They were finished to the same high power as other parts of the power section. More space was devoted to gear cutting than any other operation in the plant. Through years of deep time experience in the manufacture of gears for millions of cars and trucks, 
the corporation was well prepared to undertake the difficult job of making gears for this engine. They came in a wide assortment of sizes and shapes, each designed for the job it had to do. In this area, the nose sections and other big magnesium parts made in the magnesium foundry were machined. While all machining and manufacturing of parts for the engine stopped within a few minutes after the official announcement that Japan had surrendered, final assembly of complete engines from parts previously fabricated continued for several days, but at a greatly reduced rate, until existing supplies were used up and the lines finally closed down. Final assembly started with the power section. This sub-assembly was done at center on fixtures which moved toward the main assembly line. In other areas, the other main sub-assemblies were made ready, such as the nose section. Gears were fitted into the rear cover, and this unit routed toward the main line. One area was devoted to the assembly of the supercharger, all fed to the main line. Assembly was done on special fixtures, which were pulled down the line by slowly moving conveyor chains set in the floor. The power section was the heart of the engine, so it was one of the first to go into the fixture. Then other units, cylinders, supercharger, nose section, and other miscellaneous parts were added, with the assembly fixture inverted or tilted to make assembly operations easier to perform. In all, more than 13,000 separate parts went into each engine. Finally, the big engine was ready for its first test. After pre-oiling, the engines were placed on specially designed test stand fixtures. Before these were designed by the plant's engineers, it took almost two hours to install an engine in a test stand. With this fixture, an engine could be installed and made ready to run in a test cell in about 10 minutes. There were 44 dynamometer test cells in the plant. Instead of turning propellers, engines undergoing tests turned generators. In this way, engines on test runs produced about $25,000 worth of electricity a month, all of which was used in operating the plant, a saving of $25,000 a month to the test sale. Each engine was given a four-hour free or first test run at various speeds during which temperature, pressure, gasoline and oil consumption, and other operating performances were carefully checked. Then the engine was taken out and completely disassembled, and each part carefully inspected. Every part had to be 100% perfect after this test run, or it was replaced. Every five baskets on this line held a completely disassembled engine. After cleaning and inspection, the same engine parts were reassembled. That was done on the final assembly line, fed in turn from sub-assembly areas for which parts were taken from the conveyor back. After this assembly, the engine went back to the test cell for a final or red test run. Then it was ready to be cleaned and boxed for shipping. Each engine to be shipped was encased in a bag of biofilm and nested into a specially designed box made so it could be reused if necessary. Chemicals were packed around the engine to absorb moisture which might induce rust and corrosion. Air was pumped out of the flyer film bag, and then it was given an airtight seat. After being securely bumped, the engines were loaded into freight cars and were ready for installation at the end of their train run. Even the rollers on which they were shoved into place in the freight car were developed for the job, at a saving of many man hours over hand methods formerly used. Such savings were typical of this plan. Planned, built, equipped and operated for one purpose, the production of super bomber engines as efficiently, quickly, and economically as possible. 30,000 people worked here when its engineered production hit full strength. There was a job to do, turning 500 acres of flat land quickly into a factory to produce enough super bomber engines to put 400 airplanes in the air every month was the assignment. It was done. More than 18,000 engines were manufactured and did the job for which they were intended. Furnished power for super bombers, the long-range fast bombers which were piloted and manned by our great air force, carried destruction to the enemy wherever he was and helped bring us final victory. 